Hi everyone, welcome to this video. My name is T if you're new here and happy mother new year. I really do hope everyone's day is going well. The smash HBO hit Euphoria has just wrapped up its long awaited return to the realms of society. And of course it had us in a frenzy for eight weeks straight because I think I speak for more than a few of us when I say we was bored. So it's no surprise that when the show about a biracial lesbian struggling to stay sober after being broken up with by her trans girlfriend who was only halfway emotionally available for a number of reasons but one of them being because she fell in love after being catfished by her classmate with an arrested sexual development due to the trauma he faces from bearing witness to his father's secret queer sexcapades came back of course we were hype like literally why wouldn't we be oh euphoria is one of my favorite shows original i know and i not necessarily proudly but definitely truthfully admit that this show is a deeply problematic wildly inappropriate mess that I and millions of others still willingly choose to tune into every Sunday night. Now I gotta set the tone. I gotta set the tone because people love to be like, Euphoria is not problematic, it's relatable. Euphoria doesn't have obvious flaws and questionable structure. Euphoria is exempt from criticism because it's relatable. No, it's not. I'm sure a handful of people out there can relate to some of the characters, sure. But the reason this show is as popular as it is, is not because those are general shared experiences of my generation. We love this show because it's bad. The kids on that show are bad. Bad news. The shit they be doing? Bad news. And yeah, you know, like while certain things we can do without, such as the excessive nudity, Unfortunately, we still find the storylines riveting enough to look beyond its flawed nature and continue to watch. You don't have to try and justify it because there is no justification for it. It just is what it is. Now, back to the plot. Here's another truth bomb I wanna drop on y'all. So 40%, and this is me being modest, 40% of the reason this show is as interesting as it is is not even because the actual plot is like this work of art, but because of our collective obsession with trying to pick it apart and find a deeper meaning. And while this show has its moments, it has its good, deep, intense moments, when I shift my focus away from the shock value and the amazing cinematography, it becomes evident that the structure of some of these characters is mid and built on some pretty blatant cliches. Now my dilemma though, because again, I'm still obsessed with searching for a deeper meaning, always trying to crack the code. My dilemma is to decipher, okay, the foundation of the characters themselves Seen before, done before, predictable as fuck. But the difference with these Euphoria characters is, as predictable as they are, they're embellished with like these shocking ass circumstances that majority of us ain't never seen before. So it makes me wonder, is this show actually bad? Or is the responsibility being put back on us as viewers to challenge how we perceive the prototype? Mm. Let's figure it out together. Thank you all so much for your support of this channel, especially in my absence. As always, your viewership is more than enough, but if you're looking for more ways to support me, you can always catch me over on Patreon and feel free to check out today's sponsor, ExpressVPN. If you're anything like me, so much of our life is on the internet, which means every site we visit, every video we watch can be tracked, hacked, or worse. ExpressVPN encrypts 100% of your internet traffic. When connected to ExpressVPN, every piece of your internet data goes through a secure, encrypted tunnel and cannot be seen by anyone, not even ExpressVPN itself. I use ExpressVPN because I use the internet daily. I use the internet hourly and probably a little bit more than that. Work, shopping, entertainment, and everything in between. ExpressVPN gives me peace of mind knowing that my internet usage is not being surveilled and my information is not being sold without my knowledge. Find out how to get three months of ExpressVPN for free by visiting expressvpn.com slash tinoir or clicking the link in the description box. And of course, thank you to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this portion of today's video. Chapter one, daddy wasn't there to help me with my fear. Nathaniel Jacobs. The fictional character is a big old bitch. Wishing on his downfall is simply not enough. I need to actively participate in it. But I am not too hateful to admit that Nate's character is one of the best written on the show. 
All right, this video is about cliches. So Nate's cliche, he's just a growing boy struggling with internalized queer phobia and his mental anguish, likely onset by early childhood trauma, is positioned as the reason why he's so committed to carrying out extreme acts of physical and psychological violence. So basically, he's so upset that he might be queer, it makes him evil. What most viewers are falling for when they run, jump, hop, skip to this conclusion is what I like to call queer blame opportunism. The clear and even slightly encouraged opportunities that exist in a storyline for us to blame fucked up shit on queer existence and queer identities. Because I mean, like, it's the convenient conclusion to draw, but then trying to mask it as critical analysis. It's important that whether a villainous character or person is queer or not, we don't use their sexual identity as a smokescreen, especially when there's so much other rich ass context right there to assist us in our pursuit of understanding characters. So here's my theory. Nate's issue, his kryptonite, is ultimately fear. Fear of his father, of course, first and foremost, and then subsequently fear of fear itself. Now, many of us don't like feeling scared. Like Nate's not really that special in that aspect, but Nate's relationship with fear is especially fucked because it affects every corner of his existence. His sense of sexuality, his sense of self, his sense of family, of love, his sense of morality. Not only are those things affected, but they're like interconnected. Like he can't think about one without thinking of the others. Anything that triggers that makes him feel small, exposed, whether physically or egotistically, he retaliates with psychological torture. So for this to seem plausible, we have to closely analyze Nate's understanding of sexuality. So let's take it back to his childhood. We met young Nate Jacobs in the second episode of the first season. As soon as the episode opened, we learned that when Nate was just 11 years old, he found and decoded a hidden stash of sex tapes that his father, Cal, tucked away in his office. On these tapes, his father was mainly with men and trans women, filming them without their consent. Nate watched the tapes, all of them, and presumably continued to do so well into teenagehood, which is where he is now. 11 years old. This is so important because at this age, Nate is already aware that sex exists, but things like its meaning, its significance, etc., those are still up for interpretation and development based on what he's exposed to. According to a 2017 University of Nebraska-Lincoln study by Alyssa Bishman and Chrissy Richardson, male survey respondents were an average of just over 13 years old when they were first exposed to pornography. Now, I do wanna note that this case study was fairly small with just over 300 participants, but it was the only recent and reliable source for this statistic that I could find aside from like, mommy blog. Now based on this study, Nate was just slightly younger than the average respondent was and what we can presume was his first impactful exposure to sexually explicit imagery. This imagery, similar to how porn affects young boys, had a long lasting effect on Nate's sexual attitudes, such as his expectations of how the human body is supposed to look and function the aggressive demands he has of his sexual partners, and over time, how he understood the distinction between permitted and forbidden sex. While such early exposure can make for unrealistic sexual awareness, for most boys Nate's age, the explicit imagery they were watching were of strangers, not their own father. So this is where we shift from this imagery having not just a negative influence, but to it also causing long-lasting emotional distress, deep shock, AKA trauma. The fact that he had to search for and decode these tapes already indicated to Nate that whatever it was that was on them was wrong. Not only was he a child not supposed to see it, but no one ever was supposed to see it. Not Nate, not Nate's mom, not other adults, not even the people on the tapes themselves. Why was this so forbidden? Was it the fact that his father was cheating on his mother? Or the fact that his father's unfaithfulness wasn't with cis women altogether? Or both? Or neither? Had those tapes been with cis women, do you really think Nate wouldn't have watched? And do you really think it wouldn't have done a number on his mental state? Here's where the queer blame opportunism appears, right? Because homosexuality and transness are present in his story, salaciously at that, it can be interpreted that those aspects are the root of his trauma rather than just 
a coincidental alignment. Had it been mostly blondes on that tape, mostly skinny people, mostly fat people, mostly black people, it really wouldn't have mattered. Nate would have found the commonality and burst rage out of it either way. Because it wasn't just the gender dynamic that made these relations shocking. It wasn't just the gender dynamic that made them a violation of his innocence. Does this mean that Nate is free of bias? No, no, if anything, because of the psychological effects this had on him, he was probably more biased towards the gay and trans community. But again, not simply because they are trans and gay, but because those identities are present in his trauma. So no, I really don't believe Nate made Jules' life a living hell because he's mad that she's trans and he likes her or maybe loves her. No, I, no. He made her life a living hell because she called his bluff and made him look like the big old bitch that he is at that party. <laughs> she not only made him fearful, but she exposed that fear to a room full of people, of which he probably spent many, many years trying to build this like intimidating persona to. Now this obsession that Nate has with being perceived as powerful is also rooted in fear. I believe the perception of power became a major value for Nate in season one, episode two. In the midst of Nate viewing one of the tapes, he hears his father entering the home. And when I say we saw that little boy panic, that man left the scene. He fled the bitch. Just moments later, while young Nate is feeling scared out of his mind and confused out of his mind, his father steps into his room and basically says to him, oh no, on the contrary, he recognizes strength and bravery in young Nate. And that's a strength and bravery that's gonna take him so far that the world is gonna hate him for it. So for that reason, he can never let anyone see him sweat. Imagine the physical embodiment of your deepest, darkest fears, essentially telling you that life won't be as scary as long as nobody can tell that you're scared. It's no coincidence that that talk was juxtaposed with a clip of young Nate developing a strict workout routine and becoming super disciplined, which eventually led him to the strong physical build he has today. Very little emphasis was placed on him learning how to operate the family business or becoming mentally strong by whatever means, but only on his physique. He made it his duty to focus on the facade. He wanted to look like he was strong and powerful. And it's not until someone puts him in such a vulnerable situation that his bravado, again, of which he spent years perfecting under the pressure of unimaginable fear, it's not until that crumbles and his power is proven to be fake that he decides to enact psychological torture. Again, he began catfishing Jules after she threatened him at that party, not after he saw the tape. He decided to lie and tell his father he not only knew about the tapes, but he didn't know where one of them was, which he knew would send his father spiraling. His father literally got his ass beat by a 12 year old. He was tweaking so bad. But Nate only did that after he decided to test his strength and step to his dad, just for it to be proven that even after all these years of all that hard work, he still wasn't stronger than him. Nate decided to threaten Maddie, not just with her life, but with his life as well. Imagine what was going through her mind. He decided to psychologically torture her after she no longer had any more feelings for him. You know, after she found out about Cassie and stuff. So she had nothing to lose, essentially, when he no longer had power over her. And even through all of this, he was still having nightmares about his father. He was still dreaming about Maddie, even when he was with Cassie. And Fesco still beat his ass. Is that a cliche? Honestly, no. The foundation was laid in the plot for him to be one. And definitely the discourse we have after every episode pushes him in that direction too. But if you examine him close enough, you'll see that we've never seen a character like him before. At least I have, right? And you'll see that his sexuality though it may cause some of y'all a bit of confusion, is the least interesting thing about him. Now, whether such a critical analysis by a random viewer was the goal of the writer or not, I can't particularly say, but please stop saying that Nate Jacobs is unwell because he's gay. For one, we really don't know that yet, and for two, that's far too lazy of a conclusion to draw. Chapter two the girl who nearly drowned us in her own white tears. Cassie got the screen time Maddie deserved because white tears are a gold mine and a golden ticket to garner collective sympathy. When it comes to Cassie, 
I struggle and have always struggled to feel bad for her, which says a lot considering she's always fucking crying. Cassie's cliche is she's a young girl with daddy issues, confused about how to receive love from men, so she mistakes any attention from them, especially sex, as love. And her lack of luck in romance makes her sad, like really, really sad. This show hasn't equipped me with much to challenge that cliche, but I will say it may have expanded on it beyond what we've seen of Cassie's prototype in past media. It seems like last season we saw Cassie from her own point of view and this season we're seeing her from everyone else's. And those two perspectives are basically polar opposites. So the first season, everything was woe is Cassie. The main focus was on all the bad things that just kept happening to her. First, her father leaving, her having to get an abortion, her being slut shamed by the whole school and eventually her own boyfriend. And that same boyfriend, struggling so hard with his own masculinity, he couldn't decide whether he wanted to actually love her for who she was, or if he wanted to just use her as a sexual ornament. Y'all, Cassie done been through it. And we as viewers spent all of season one being reminded why Cassie is worthy of feeling bad for. And there was no need to question that because she was worthy of feeling bad for. That was season one though. This season, we're still watching Cassie at her self-pity party. Still, with similar hysteria as before, except now, all the bad things that are happening to her, she went out looking for. And we as viewers were forced to follow her on these missions to literally no avail. Now here's where the cliche gets a cute little remix. I've been peeped from time that in the same way Lexi feels overshadowed by Cassie, Cassie feels overshadowed by Maddie. Like you really don't have to pay too close attention to peep that. But I think it's interesting how although Cassie feels like she lives in Maddie's shadow in her reality, right, in Cassie's world, in actuality, Maddie was the one positioned in Cassie's shadow. In season two, episode seven, we saw for the first time just how close Cassie and Maddie were. Not only did we see how close they were, but we also saw how similar they were. Just like Cassie, Maddie was a young woman who got loads of attention for the way she looked. Just like Cassie, Maddie had issues with her life at home. And of course, because they're close in age, they probably like had similar interests in like fashion and music, things like that. But unlike Cassie, Maddie did not seek external validation as a means to soothe her trauma. When it became clear to Cassie that no matter what Maddie's personal choices were, even down to her own sexual choices, prop, questionable as they were. Maddie was never gonna be slut shamed in the same way that Cassie was. She was never gonna be disrespected in the same way that Cassie was. She was never going to be hidden and kept a secret and felt ashamed of in the way that Cassie was. It's because she wants the world to receive her the same way it's received Maddie. But Cassie doesn't have the confidence or frankly the originality to let that happen organically or to just stop caring what everyone else thinks like Lexi did. You see, <laughs> you see how Lexi was in a similar position, you know, feeling overshadowed, but she ain't fuck nobody ex. Cassie doesn't have the originality for that, right? She doesn't have the creativity for it. So instead, she just became a human replica of Maddie. Pretending to be crazy, this new little makeover that she got, even down to her getting with Nate in the first place. It's cause she wanted to be Maddie. I don't hate that storyline. As you can see, I'm, I'm quite invested in this aspect of it actually. But the main thing that's sticking out to me is Maddie is the center of Cassie's life. Cassie very much would not have a storyline this season if it was not for Maddie existing. Yet Maddie's presence in the actual show, minuscule. We saw very little of how Cassie studied Maddie, very little of what specific characteristics of Maddie's Cassie chose to pull inspiration from and when and in what order. On top of that, Maddie was the one traumatized. Maddie was the one betrayed, but it was overshadowed by us being shown the depths of Cassie's feelings as if we weren't already keen on the fact that Cassie has a lot of feelings. So is Cassie a cliche? A remixed one, but yes. Again, a young girl with daddy issues, confused about how to receive love from men, which has led her to being a deceitful, envious, jealous best friend. But I do wanna give the benefit of the doubt that 
that was the point. She was written with such unoriginality and predictability that we were supposed to see her like that. And maybe even possibly examining how centering the white gaze in media subsequently erases characters of color around them. Chapter three, the tough cookie always crumbles. If you've been tuning into my Euphoria live stream recaps on Patreon, then you know that I have feelings about everybody. I have intricate thoughts about everybody on that show, except Maddie. Let me tell you something, I know y'all love her. And this is where celebrity culture really be saving this show's ass because I get it. Everyone loves the actress who plays Maddie. Alexa Demi. She's cool, she's hip, hot, and happening. And she's over 30. <gasps> Might as well be a dinosaur the way y'all be acting, but whatever. None of that makes her a good character. Maddie is boring. Well, actually, she's not boring, which I'll explain in this character. She's not boring, but she was written to be a fucking snooze fest. Her cliche is also so predictably layered. So she's like, your typical feminine pretty girl. Though her femininity is not like traditional in the pink Barbie doll sense, you know, she definitely has a dark aesthetic. She's still dainty and delicate. She definitely go and pucker them lips and bat them eyelashes and of course, clank those nails. <laughs> but ultimately, she's the tough cookie spicy Latina. And for that tired ass trope, let's get ready to rumble because she deserves better. The spicy Latina trope is a problem because aside from the nonstop over-sexualization and exoticization of their bodies, even in inappropriate non-sexual settings, her eccentric nature, which is usually highlighted by her over-dramatized emotions and her feisty, sometimes violent attitude, is used to color the world around her, which is conveniently centered around the boring, bland, white people in her life. Again, Nate and Cassie's stories, not boring, not bland but their personalities. Similar to your stereotypical spicy Latina, Maddie possesses other non-problematic attributes that are a recipe for an excellent relatable character. I mean, shit, don't we know by now that the self-centered, super vain, pretty girl can actually be interesting? Wouldn't it be a relief to find out how even at such a young, tender age, a young woman can be so confident in herself, already possessing all of the validation she needs internally. So she's not out here trying to seek it from boys and friends and gossip and shit like that. Do we not wanna know more about the mental mechanics of a person who effortlessly and remorselessly milks the fuck out of any power and privilege she can find? Yet, people are still drawn to her. Is that not an area of interest? This sounds like the type of person who insecure girls would aspire to be. This sounds like the type of person who, if aligned with someone who is jealous and unoriginal, would suck the life out of her. So why are we not seeing more of Maddie? I just, and what sucks even more is if it wasn't for her walking around with like this bad bitch, tough cookie, always ready to fight persona, which don't even fit her by the way, Maddie is not scary. I, like, I don't know a better way to explain it, but like, just because she wears dark makeup and rarely ever smiles with teeth, that's not enough to convince me that she could beat me up. And that little weak ass fight they had at the play, I just know that the generation who grew up on World Star is not impressed by a slap in the face and a shove to the wall. I just know it. Listen, I condone fictional violence. I, I condone justified fictional violence, okay? Maddie should have mopped the flow with that hoe. Anyway, if people weren't so entranced or enamored by this tough cookie persona that the story is trying to force on her, it would be clear as day how lackluster her character was written to be. Just cause she's not crying as much as Cassie doesn't mean she's not affected by the whole Nate situation. She's just better at hiding it cause she's a tough cookie. But the tough cookie always crumbles. Just like the femme fatale, they go hand in hand. And if you've been around Tina War headquarters for more than a couple months, you already know. I'm not the biggest fan of the femme fatale archetype. Maddie is a poorly written cliche and I struggle to view her as anything even slightly more complex than that. 
not only is it giving cliche and boring but it's giving white gaze it's giving she clearly has more to her but whoever is writing her only acknowledges her existence as it is in proximity to the wicked ass white people around her and if you don't believe me just listen we are two seasons in 16 hours worth of content in and the most interesting thing people could come up with is making fun of how she was banging on the door in season two episode one or how she was clanking her nails in episode six do you see how desperate even we are to make her more visible in the storyline okay so from me to the writer's room of euphoria Please make Maddie more visible in the storyline, not just in the head of someone who's actually visible in the storyline, not just in the memory or the fear, but like actually in our face, we see, give her lines. Yes. Chapter four, life's rough for the duff. Kat's cliche is one of the most carefully curated of the bunch. And it's actually really hard to put a name to it because she obviously hasn't gotten the same amount of screen time in season two that she got in season one. And boy, I oughta. How is it that so much attention was paid to Kat's size? The size of her body, the size of her imagination, the size of her ego, even the size of her insecurities. How is it that she was written to be so large and so bold in every aspect of her existence? But this season, we're lucky if we see her for more than 10 consecutive minutes. More than five, really. Now I've read up on the speculation as to why Kat's storyline was cut so short, allegedly because Barbie Ferreira, the actress who plays Kat, and Sam Levinson, the writer, director, executive producer of the show, had disagreements about the direction Kat's character was headed in, and that caused beef, allegedly. Um, I really don't give a damn. As a viewer, what happens behind the camera ain't none of my beeswax. I mean, as long, as long as everything's like ethical and no one's being mistreated, as long as we have those ducks in a row, I don't care about no little argument. What that got to do with the viewers? Why we had to suffer? She was so important in season one and it makes no sense why she's so inconsequential this season. So again, Kat's cliche was hard to decipher because all I have to base it on is one season worth of content as opposed to the rest of the characters, aside from Maddie, of which I have much more context to support my arguments. So let's just talk about Kat season one. When we first met Kat, she was the Duff, the designated ugly fat friend. Big emphasis on that word designated because Kat was never ugly. Barbie Ferreira is literally a model like, not like, oh, she bad, she a model. No, like, it's on the resume. So yeah, not ugly. Um, the only unconventional thing about Kat is she houses a marginalized body, which sticks out, especially when she's thrown into the middle of her petite friend group. As we learned in season one, Kat's size was something she always felt insecure about. And her adolescent insecurity reached its peak when she was 11 years old and gained 20 pounds. Which was such an excessive over-dramatization, by the way. Like, who really gains 20 pounds after drinking, what was it, 72 pina coladas on an eight day family vacation? Dragging it. But yeah, her weight gain led to her being dumped by her, I think it was sixth grade boyfriend, Daniel. Little sack of shit. Now considering 11 years old is around the time that most young girls are either hitting puberty or definitely aware that it's on the way, we have to take into account the impact this had on Kat's self image and how the trauma of being dumped for her size implanted the idea that her weight would always be a roadblock or at least an area of conversation whenever she was trying to form intimate relationships. I'd like to reference a 2014 essay by Melissa Fabrizio of the University of Alberta called Abundantly Invisible, Fat Oppression as a Framework for Sexual Violence Against Women. In regard to how culturally upheld fat phobia affects young girls, Fabrizio writes, Beginning in childhood, fat girls are denied a critical aspect of their adolescent sexual development by not feeling worthy of sexual desire. For fat girls that grow into fat women, the bullying experienced in youth intensifies with age as they become an adult member of the structural hierarchy that oppresses them. We flash back to the pilot of season one. We see Kat in a room with three boys trying to convince them that she isn't a prude. All the while remembering Jules's shocked reaction when she first told her that she was a virgin. 
bitch, this is in the 80s. You need to catch a dick. This pretty much set Kat on a mission to, I guess, catch up to the rest of the girls in her grade and begin her sexual career, so to speak. Her trying to show resistance against this prudeness label that was placed on her just because she's fat goes as far as her not only removing her top under pressure, but her pretending to be amused when the boys clearly insultingly made a sexual generalization that was based on her weight. And long story short, that same night, despite being bullied, she had sex for the first time. A video was taken, it wound up on the internet. She saw how much attention it was getting, so she became a webcam sugar baby used that money to give herself a dominatrix makeover and then began having frequent casual sex. Because of the temporary confidence this sparked in Kat, it seemed so empowering. And to a degree, I'm sure it was. Listen, Kat's body and how she feels about her body don't have shit to do with me. I'm not gonna sit up here and be like, it's wrong for women with bodies similar to Kat's to find joy in seeing her represented in a desired and main character energy type of way. Kat's character defied the status quo and I love that for y'all. But I also remember doing a video on fat phobia about a year ago and a common comment I got was that another way that fat phobia reappears in art and in life is sexual fetishization masked as empowerment. Now that I can relate to. I can relate to people noticing your demographics erasure in the world. So instead of actually seeing you and offering you the humanity that the world denies you on a daily basis, they jump straight into viewing you as a sexual object. They treat you as something to be consumed. And then they feel good about themselves for doing so because I mean, hey, exploitative attention is better than no attention, right? Yeah, I can relate to that. And that's what I realized was happening with Kat. After several watches, y'all, I have seen season one like a good seven times and I only realized this on like watch five. Kat was an underage sex worker. We realized this, right? Kat's confidence redemption came from having sexual encounters with losers. That guy she hooked up with at the carnival, statutory. In the same aforementioned essay, Fabrizio writes, The discourse surrounding fat women's sexuality is aggressive and harmful in that it places fat women in a position to be thankful for any type of sexual attention, even if it is unwarranted or unwanted. The blatant denial of fat women's sexuality enables abusers to objectify and assault fat women. It also produces a rhetoric that enables society as a whole to excuse violence against fat women and blame these women for their deviant bodies by emphasizing how fat women should be thankful for any type of sexual attention since they are so unworthy of it. Kat's run-ins with these adult men, it's hard to call it violence because it was consensual, but then again, it's hard to call it consensual because she's a minor. All I know is it wasn't right, but it was completely glossed over because I mean, at least she was getting some attention. There was never any of that, at least she was getting attention talk when the conversation was about Maddie and Tyler or when it was about Jules and Nate's dad. It was made clear that even though those girls were active participants, it was still wrong. But when it came to Kat, that was completely glossed over. And I wonder why. Her confidence being built through sexual validation was always gonna blow up in her face. So I'm thinking, oh yeah, season two, like we getting that, we getting that for sure. We're gonna see that confidence facade explode. And we nearly got there. We nearly got there, season two, episode two, you know, when she admitted that she had all this pressure to love herself. So she just hastily chose what seemed like the easiest and most profitable option, but it lacked integrity. It was all fake. Here's why I say we nearly got that revelation because it came right after her realizing she doesn't love her boyfriend. Boho, like what? Why did we have to detour like that? So now it seems like the message that was being pushed was your typical, you can't love anyone else if you don't first love yourself. And it's like, or she just wasn't all that physically attracted to him. Ethan, Kat's ex-boyfriend and a new fan favorite. Shout out to Ethan in the play, going up for that Emmy, I see. But anyway, Ethan doesn't look super similar to the guys in Kat's, like who Kat has been with before. So it's possible that she adores the way Ethan treats her, 
but it just doesn't really have the hots for him. It's also possible that the reason she was attracted to those other guys in the first place was due to the inappropriate nature of their encounters and the thrill she found in the lack of mutual respect. All that is possible, but we wouldn't know because we haven't seen her. So after all that work, we're back at square one. Kat is a confused and insecure teenager and she can't figure out why. This is probably the most relatable storyline we're ever gonna get out of this show. Being insecure about your body image, taking drastic measures as a desperate attempt to change that, and then making it even worse? Sounds familiar to me. <laughs> we need more of Kat. There is so much left for us to learn about Kat, and she is like the last character that needs to be disregarded. Chapter five. Face tats and sneak attacks. Jules might be one of, if not the most irresponsibly written character on this show. Mm. Mm. I hate this. I hate that I'm saying this because I'm so, so proud of Hunter Schaefer for just her excellent performance of Jules and the way she brings Jules to life is amazing. I have nothing bad to say. The acting is phenomenal, but this confused, impulsive, restless, deceitful character is <laughs> i just wish they would have assigned those characteristics to any other character but the trans one and y'all i really don't want to overstep by saying this but like i got it's pissing me off now actually i now realize that i may have in fact overstepped in my analysis of jules Especially since majority of my criticism is based on my belief that her character flaws are way too closely tied to her sexuality and even sometimes her gender identity. So I've made the decision to not share this opinion with hundreds of thousands of people and instead leave it on Patreon where I know I'll get the honest feedback and challenges I need to better approach this stance. I like what Jules brings to the storyline. Um, I, I like having her around, but she deserves better, methinks. Let's move on because I'm already like, I don't even know if I'm gonna leave this in a video. Okay, lastly, we have Rue, Fezco, and Lexi, who, as you may have noticed, don't have their own chapter in this video because my thoughts on them are basically non-existent. As Kay would say, my head is so empty on this particular subject, I could hold my nose and fart through my fucking ears. I have no thoughts. Except, when it comes to Rue, I don't have many feelings about who she is as a person because I don't know who she is as a person. We don't know Rue the person, we know Rue the addict. Additionally, Rue's special episode, of which I dedicated an entire YouTube video to, really helped me grapple with my own biases against people struggling with substance abuse. Um, so that's where I wanna leave it. I wanna leave it right there. Until I can get to know Rue the sober person, I have nary a thing to say, okay? Now, Fesco. Um, I like Fezco, but I won't miss him. I'm sorry about the way things went down though. Oh, no, because he just wanted to look handsome at the play. Like he had the bouquet of flowers and a note. Felt really bad. But the only reason y'all love off Angus Cloud for the way he plays Fezco is because he's white. Mm. Ugh. Like, I'm already getting bored. I really don't want to talk about it this much longer because it's like, I'm the black scent lady, right? Right? I'm the YouTuber who's forever hunting down these white people who are trying to costume and satirize stereotypical black existence or whatever. But this is not that, I don't think. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm, I don't know. I don't think Angus appropriates AAVE. He definitely uses it, but I don't think he appropriates it. And no, I'm not going to explain the difference. Go back in the channel. But I do think that Fezco is pretty much boring, muted character who, if played by a black man, wouldn't get nearly half the love y'all show Angus because y'all simply wouldn't be impressed. So I don't mind Fezco. I really don't think his character is all that problematic. Um, but the way y'all uplift him as if he's really doing shit with that role, it's very telling. Um, and that's it. Oh wait, no. And Lexi, uh, great show, uh, gorgeous gowns, gorgeous, gorgeous gowns. But I'm so sorry that because she is so normal and relatable, I had no interest in analyzing her beyond face value, even though she had like hella screen time this season. I am sorry about that. But yeah. <laughs> 
thank you all so much for watching especially if you made it all the way to the end of the video I, <laughs> but if there's one thing you should take from this video aside from what we've already talked about it's that no show no piece of art no celebrity written series is exempt from criticism ever also you can criticize something and still feel compelled to watch uh, like I said, I enjoy the hell out of Euphoria. It is one of my favorite shows and I just love how it brings people together. Like <laughs> I was at um, this cafe called Sip and Play in Brooklyn the other day and there was this young couple. They looked like they were in high school and they were just like scrunched up together watching the season finale of Euphoria on his phone screen and they were just like silently being like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, and like reacting to each other and I thought it was so cute. Like it brought them together even though it was on that little ass phone screen like they got together to share that moment because the show is just that damn captivating so like yeah multiple things can be true at once whatever um shout out to my patrons for rocking with me and for showing up to my patreon live streams as i tried my best to figure this show out um hit me up on there if you're looking for some exclusive content be sure to leave your thoughts and your comments down below give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down however you're feeling today and subscribe for more content i'll catch you in the next video bye